In all stages of the school experiment, testing was essential to localize the child's mental state on an official rating scale. Bloom's epic spawned important descendant forms, mastery learning, outcomes-based education, and school-to-work government-business collaborations. Each classified individuals for the convenience of social managers and businesses. Each offered data useful in controlling the mind and movements of the young, mapping the next adult generation. But for what purpose? Why was this being done? A large piece of the answer can be found by reading between the lines of an article that appeared in the June 1998 issue of Foreign Affairs. Written by Mortimer Zuckerman, the essay praises the American economy, characterizing its lead over Europe and Asia as so structurally grounded, no nation can possibly catch up for a hundred years. American workers and the American managerial system are unique. You are intrigued, I hope. So was I. And unless you believe in master race biology, our advantage can only have come from the training of the American young, in school and out. Training which produces attitudes and behavior useful to management. What might these crucial determinants of business success be? First, says Zuckerman, the American worker is a pushover. That's my translation, not his, but I think it's a fair take on what he means when he says the American is indifferent to everything but a paycheck. Next, says Zuckerman, workers in America live in constant panic and fear is a secret supercharger, giving management flexibility no other country has. Next, in the United States, human beings don't make decisions. Abstract formulas do. Management by mathematical rules makes the company manager-proof as well as worker-proof. And finally, our endless consumption completes the charm cycle. Consumption driven by non-stop addiction to novelty, a habit which provides American business with the only reliable domestic market in the world. Elsewhere, in hard times, business dries up. But not here. Here we shop till we drop, mortgaging the future in bad times as well as good. Can't you feel in your bones that Zuckerman is right? I have little doubt the fantastic wealth of American big business is psychologically and procedurally grounded in our form of schooling. The training field for these grotesque human qualities is the classroom. Schools train individuals to respond as a mass. Boys and girls are drilled in being bored, frightened, envious, emotionally needy, and generally incomplete. A successful mass production economy requires such a clientele. A small business, small farm economy like that of the Amish requires individual competence, thoughtfulness, compassion, and universal participation. Our own requires a managed mass of leveled, spiritless, anxious, familyless, friendless, and obedient people who believe the difference between Cheers and Seinfeld is a subject worth arguing about. The extreme wealth of American big business is the direct result of school having trained us in certain attitudes, like a craving for novelty. That's what the bells are for. They don't ring so much as to say, now for something different. The secret of American schooling is that it doesn't teach the way children learn, and it isn't supposed to. School was engineered to serve a concealed command economy and a deliberately restratified social order. It wasn't made for the benefit of kids and families as those individuals and institutions would define their own needs. School is the first impression children get of an organized society. And like most first impressions, it is a lasting one. According to school, life is dull and stupid. Only consumption promises relief. Coke, Big Macs, fashion, jeans, that's where the real meaning is found. That's the classroom's lesson, however indirectly delivered. These decisive dynamics which make forced schooling poisonous to healthy human development aren't hard to spot. Work in classrooms isn't significant work. 
It fails to satisfy real needs pressing on the individual. It doesn't answer real questions experience raises in the young mind. It doesn't contribute to solving any problem encountered in actual life. The net effect of making all schoolwork external to individual longings, experiences, questions, and problems is to render the victim listless. This phenomenon has been well understood at least since the time of the British enclosure movement, which forced small farmers off their land into factory work. Growth and mastery come only to those who vigorously self-direct, initiating, creating, doing, reflecting, freely associating, enjoying privacy? These are precisely what the structures of schooling are set up to prevent on one pretext or another. As I watched it happen, it took about three years to break most kids. Three years confined to environments of emotional neediness with nothing real to do. In such environments, songs, smiles, bright colors, cooperative games, and other tension breakers do the work better than angry words and punishment. Years ago, it struck me as more than a little odd that the Prussian government was the patron of Heinrich Pestalozzi, inventor of multicultural fun and games psychological elementary schooling, and of Friedrich Frobel, inventor of kindergarten. It struck me as odd that J.P. Morgan's partner, Peabody, was instrumental in bringing Prussian schooling to the prostrate South after the Civil War. But after a while, I began to see that behind the philanthropy lurked a rational economic purpose. The strongest meshes of the school net are invisible. Constant bidding for a stranger's attention creates a chemistry producing the common characteristics of modern school children. Whining, dishonesty, malice, treachery, and cruelty. Unceasing competition for official favor in the dramatic fishbowl of a classroom delivers cowardly children. Little people sunk in chronic boredom. Little people with no apparent purpose for being alive. The most destructive dynamic is identical to that which causes caged rats to develop eccentric or even violent mannerisms when they press a bar for sustenance on an A-periodic.